after discussing the regular branches of root functions, the inverse of their power type functions, let's turn our attention to the logarithm, the inverse of the exponential function. As we have seen, the extraction of the regular branch is required because of the multivalidness of the inverse function. The log of x is defined for real positive x, but if we allow for the x to assume complex values, we must face the fact that the log function is not single valid anymore. And indeed, let's consider the equation e to the power of w is equal to x. And as is clear, the exponents of log x, log x plus 2 pi i plus 4 pi i, actually plus 2 pi i n, where n is an integer, are all equal to x. And it's not clear which value to choose. The situation seems to be more complicated than in the case of the inverse of power type functions. For example, the inverse of z squared is double valued, but the inverse of the exponential seems to assume infinite amount of values. If x is real and positive, not all of these values are created equal, and we are happy to choose the real one, which is usually and hereafter called the logarithm of x. But what if we want to define the logarithm of a complex number z? Well, the best way to do this is simply to solve their defining equation e to the power of w equals z. We split w into the real and imaginary part, and z on the right-hand side is turned into the modulus of z and the corresponding exponential. And then we have u equals the logarithm of modulus of z, while v equals argument of z plus 2 pi n. And here is the formal definition of the logarithm of a complex number z. It's logarithm of modulus z plus i argument of z plus 2 pi i n. The question is, can we pick up some particular value of n, say n equals 0, and define the principal logarithm, which is well defined in the entire complex plane, or at least meromorphic in the complex plane? Well, to answer this question, let's resort to the geometrical interpretation. So, we draw a complex plane, and here is our x, the real positive number, and the logarithm of x, which is well defined. And then we make a rotation into a complex plane, and now our x is turned into a complex number z, which is modulus of z times e to i phi. And the generalization of the logarithm will simply give us log of modulus of z plus i phi, which is exactly our principal value of the log function. But now what we do, let's make this infamous 2 pi rotation in the complex plane around the origin. We return to the same point, but our log function will change. It will undergo this 2 pi i addition. So we started with the principal value of the log function, but after returning to the same point, it's smoothly translated into another branch of this logarithm. So what do we conclude from this? Well, we are unable to separate this particular value of our log function. After n rotations, it will inevitably change into the same value plus 2 pi i n. So this way, the log function by definition is an infinite value function in the entire complex plane. And to make it single valued, we need to draw a branch card starting at branch point. And obviously the branch point here is the origin, and the branch cut should stretch to infinity. So let's now study the extraction of the regular branches of the composite function. Say now w equals logarithm of g of z, where g of z is assumed to be single valued and meromorphic in the complex plane. And as with the case of power type functions, we'll argue that the zeros and poles of these g of z functions are in fact the branch points of the log function. And we use the same reasoning. Suppose z sub b is the simple root of our g function. So we study the analytic behavior of our w function in the vicinity of this root. We make a Taylor expansion of g of z function and retain only the leading term c1 times z minus z sub b. And this way the w function is greatly simplified. And we see that if we make a rotation around the small circle centered at point z sub b, the 
then our log function undergoes this 2 pi i addition. And we conclude that z sub b, the zero of our g function, is a branch point. So we need to draw a branch cut starting or ending at this point. So the same logic is applied if g of z function has a pole. And we come to the conclusion that indeed zeros and poles of the function under the logarithm are the branch points of this composite function. And now let's study how to build a particular regular branch of this composite function. Well, we use the same schematic as we did for the power type functions. So we start with the formal definition of the w function. And we need to choose some reference point, say z0, and pick up some value for our log function, say w0. And we are interested in the value of this function at some arbitrary point z. In other ways, we are interested in the evolution of this pair z and w as we travel from the reference point z0 to the arbitrary point z in a complex plane. And we start with a drawing a contour connecting point z0 and z, and the only condition that it shouldn't cross the branch cut. Then we determine the change of the argument of g function as we travel from z0 to z, and we denote it as delta argument of g from z0 to z. And then we rewrite the right-hand side of our defining equations in the similar manner as we did for power type functions. So e to w is equal to g of z divided by g of z0 times g of z0. Then the ratio is rewritten as the modulus of the ratio times the corresponding exponential And then we take logarithm of both parts of this equation. So on the left-hand side, we obtain w of z. But on the right-hand side, we should pick up the correct values of the multivalent log. And we should do it in such a way that uh, the obtained function will assume value w0 at point z0. And here we go. We obtain logarithm of the modulus. plus i times delta change of the argument of g function. And under the logarithm of g of z0, we should substitute w0. And here is the final formula for the regular branch of our multivalent function. It's uniquely defined and assumes the value w0 at point z0. And now let's have some practice. Let's study, for example, the simplest possible function, the logarithm of z. Let's draw a branch cut, say, along the negative real semi-axis. So let's fixate the regular branch of this function. And we'll assume the most natural fixation, namely for real positive x, the logarithm of x is assumed to be real valued. And now let's find the value of this logarithm at point z equals negative 2 plus i0 and negative 2 minus i0. So these are the infinitely closed twin points separated by the branch cuts and located on the upper and lower bank of this branch cut. Okay, let's start with point on the upper bank of the branch cut, minus 2 plus i0. So what we do? According to our schematic, we pick out some reference point, say x0, on the real positive semi-axis. And we know that at this point the logarithm is well-defined and it's equal to uh, the real number. And then we draw a contour connecting this reference point and the point minus 2 plus i0. Then our g of z function is simply z and the change of its argument is the change of the argument of z number. And we see that z number rotates by angle pi in the counterclockwise direction. So delta argument of z is pi. And then we simply employ our formula. W of minus 2 plus i0 is equal to the 
logarithm of the modulus of negative 2, and we drop this i0 term because it's a modulus, divided by x0 plus i pi and plus logarithm of x0. Now we simplify the modulus under the logarithm. We'll turn it simply into the logarithm of 2 divided by x0, since x0 is positive. And then we add up these two logarithms and we see that x0 vanishes. So, of course, the value of this logarithm should be independent of a starting point. And we obtain log of 2 plus i pi. And in the same manner, we compute the value of the log at point on the lower bank of the branch card. So, again, let's connect x0 and point minus 2 minus i0 with some counter. And we see that the change of the argument of z is different now. It's a clockwise rotation. The delta argument of z is minus pi. And here goes the same type of calculation. w of minus 2 minus i0 is again equal to the logarithm of minus 2 divided by x0 minus i pi and plus the logarithm of x0. And again, we get rid of this modulus sign under the first logarithm and obtain logarithm of 2 minus i pi. And we see that the difference between the values of the log or on the upper and lower banks of the branch cut is strictly 2 pi i. This is how it is done for simple cases. And of course, more non-trivial examples with log functions are due to in our next lectures.